So um, I, I, um, I should mention, I, I haven't done this recently, but a long time ago, I've, I've started a few virtual worlds that had uh, economies in them. And the best known, um, I worked with a guy named uh, Philip Rosedale, a friend of mine, on something called Second Life that you might have heard of that was one of the earliest e experiments at scale of uh, a virtual goods economy. And I was actually pretty happy with, like, I was thinking, wow, for such a crude first pass, this is great. Like, we, we got a lot happening. Anyway, so there are these questions. And they came from the community by some method. Did you use quadratic voting to choose these? <laughs> or is it, is, it like some ra is it like some opaque process from a central authority? <laughs> the latter. The latter? OK, oh, good, goody. Uh, so, um, so the, I'll, I guess I'll just ask these questions and we can talk about them. There's not too many of them. Um, would you please introduce yourselves? God, I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, and what you're working on in the blockchain space. And as the moderator, I choose you first. All right. Uh, my name is Graham McBain. I'm just a meat bag in the simulation like you guys. Uh, currently working on a company called XYO Network, and that's uh, geospatial location protocol, so proof of origin and how to locate things in a virtual world. Hey, I'm Jim Wah. I've been working on a project called Video for about two and a half years, and that helps creators get sponsored without compromising their integrity. And as a result of that project, we actually introduced the ERC-888 multidimensional token structure, which has since then evolved our project into the CREATE protocol with the number eight, um, which is for transparent collaboration. Hey there, my name is Jameson Detweiler. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of a company called Phantasmo. Um, so we basically are, our objective is to create a complete and total 3D digital twin of the world to enable persistent AR and autonomous robotics and autonomous vehicles, all these futuristic applications. Uh, and we're uh, building a protocol that's sort of an incentive uh, for uh, crowdsourced data contribution and then also hosting and distributing that data as well. My name is Billy Rennekamp. I'm an artist and a developer and uh, prototyped a lot of different games and experiments using different token economics and artworks. I'm also working for Cosmos. OK, uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit from the questions because I feel this innate need to resist centralized opaque authority. <laughs> I, we yeah, oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> those, those two things, as we all know from history, are indistinguishable. All right, so my qu for the four of you, which of you have a system running where somebody you don't know has gotten paid for doing something in a virtual world? Or it depends on what you mean by virtual world. It's not like Second Life. Right? Okay. I'd say your phone is a virtual world. I, I, we're not gonna, one thing <laughs> we're not going to do is debate what virtual means. I, can, sure. I assure you that, that you will waste your life on that question. <laughs> I, uh, I have a couple, but they're all on test networks, so does that count? Sure, sure. No, I'm just trying to get a sense for how, how, how far. And what did the people who got paid do on yours and on yours? They created content and received support from an investor, a market maker. And this was a event. patronage volunteer model? Yeah, directly from the sponsor to a creator, no middleman. And what kind of content was it? Video content. And, and in your case? Uh, one was a meme market. A meme market, OK. That's like a, that's like a meat market, but. <laughs> The, 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 I don't know if meat or memes go bad faster, but. Um, memes, definitely memes. Yeah, they both need hooks, I guess. All right, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, okay. So uh, the next question from the, from the community or wherever is, what are the most radical token models and projects you've seen to date? The most, rad and radical is a precisely de term, uh, defined term, as we all know. Uh, so, any, any seen anything radical? Uh, I don't know if it's radical, but I just am, will take any opportunity to rep Spank Chain. I think um, issuing your own ERC-20 and then your own stablecoin backed on a staked version of that ERC-20 and it working is ridiculous. So, I think they're, it's a pretty cool model. All right. Radical. I really like the idea of multi-class tokens and composable tokens, these kind of more complex structures emerging in the, in the space. Um, for me, I mean, I have to think about this question earlier. I think that uh, just seeing sort of various, uh, one of the projects I'm more interested in right now is Augmentors and seeing what they're doing with uh, collectibles and sort of intersecting with augmented worlds, rather. I think what MakerDAO's done with DAI is super radical model and super interesting, complicated, many moving parts, but seems to be working. 
Cool. Cool. Um, I am not familiar with some of the things you've brought up, and I will find <laughs> out about them. Um, <laughs> these, qu you know, <laughs> hey, community. <laughs> Community, these are not great questions, <laughs> all right? And since you made these, you, ne you need to be s told that. Okay, here's, <laughs> here's the next question. Are there any projects, any projects in the space we can learn lessons from? <laughs> it's not a well-focused question, <laughs> okay? Anyway, here, do you, do you have any lessons to share that you've seen from projects? What if I just pretend I'm a politician and answer the question I want to answer? Um, <laughs> No, sure. I think, hey, I, I, that's what no, I No, mean. I think there, there was a question on there that I thought was really interesting. It's like, who's doing interesting stuff in the VR, AR world? Has anybody heard of a project called Rec Room? Yeah. It, so Rec Room is this really cool idea where it's a 3D space that anybody can create for, and you could just pull objects from the Unity store and create your own 3D space and just publish it to the Rec Room network. That's a pretty incredible opportunity. Anyone can just sort of copy paste a virtual environment. And what we're talking about a lot of here is virtual objects and virtual economies. That's sort of the first project that's allowing people to really experiment. And, and the CEO actually said that most rec rooms now on the platform are user created. They're not created by the company. So that's like a really cool, really underground project that's coming around. And I think like for projects like Phantasmo, that's the sort of world that we want to see happen in this radical virtual markets. Yeah, I'll just answer that question too. Because <laughs> uh, I'm really excited not only about immersive experiences, you know, like virtual movies, games, these kind of things, but also augmenting reality and overlaying uh, physical objects with virtual objects that can be manipulated, designed intentionally for, for certain uh, goals. Why? What? Why? Why? <laughs> oh, because I think we can, we can better coordinate around shared goals with greater transparency and accountability. And if we represent the real world uh, objectively, we can, we can do that. Um, sorry, I was just thinking about reflecting on that one. Um, in terms of like some of the things I think that are really interesting right now, uh, going back into sort of like like the um, the augmenters a little bit, I think one of the things that's fascinating with them and what they're doing is having the collectibles, but being able to actually like meet up in a real space and leverage those, and you're sort of crossing these virtual goods or rather virtual characters with your physical presence, and you kind of create. A little bit closer to like what I think you, people kind of expected Pokemon Go to be, and I think those are things that I think about for a long time. I think are really, really interesting, um, and also incredibly viral too, because you are able to use them all the time, and people are going to ask you like, "What are you doing?" Because you look crazy. Um, I may be a bit of a skeptic of the AR VR world. Uh, I think I'm more excited about virtual worlds um, when you talk about communities on top of communities, or sort of structures of people that are connected, but maybe aren't apparent in the way that uh, maybe the times, what were you talking about earlier? Mimes, the... Uh, Memes? No, no, no. <laughs> mids, mids. Mids! The, mids. Way, the oh, way mids, okay. in a way, are virtual worlds or so, some sort of self-organizing factor of communities and how that overlays on top uh -huh. of each other all the time and seeing that sort of reemerge or rebuild through decentralized organizations or sort of like recommunicizing or something like that. I'm just curious. You're not that into the sort of eyepiece kind of virtual world, and um, are the three of you into that? Yeah, totally. <laughs> What's your favorite virtual world sort of experience you've had with a headset? Mine is playing the Silicon Valley game. Uh, it's like not really a shoot 'em up or like a racing game, but like really just interacting with the characters, like the actors, like right in front of you, and you go through the story. I thought that was really cool. Um, and also, as a wannabe rock star, rock band. Um, <laughs> but I had the benefit of going to a Future of Storytelling conference and, ex and you know, testing all these things. I think it's still kind of out of the reach of the uh, average mm. consumer like myself. Mine, mine was really simple. It was one of the first AR games on iPhone. And it was just, it brought up a gun, and you could shoot people, and it would make explosion noises. And it was super, my toddler nephew played with it for hours, and it was just. <laughs> And extraordinarily fun and simple. Uh, mine is actually a, a Google Tango game um, uh, by this Japanese game designer uh, called World, W-O-O-R-L-D. Uh, only on that platform has been re-released, which basically just allows you to map out the room that you're in and then actually build uh, sort of this virtual world that you manage that's directly integrated with your room. Mm. Cool. You know, um, 
just for what got me into economics originally back, so I, I had the first VR company back in the 80s for whatever, it, it, that's not important, but way back then, the problem I had is that um, the, this, this paradigm for motivating people with a game where you say we're gonna use behaviorist techniques and you're gonna go for this goal like Pavlov's dog salivating at this thing and you're gonna solve the maze or kill the aliens or whatever it is, um, felt very uh, limiting of the human spirit to me because you're putting people into a closed system that's defined. You're saying here, here's my maze, now you'll live in my maze. And if you try to think about some kind of an open system in which people are creative and inventing, you, that is economics, there's no other way to think about that. That was my pathway into it. And I still, I feel this kind of visceral dislike of the idea of a game with rules created by somebody else. I don't, you know, and I, I'm always amazed that in the technical world that's so into decentralized authority and into fighting the power and everything, they're saying, okay, we're gonna go play this game. And I'm like, what? How can you guys wanna do that? It's always mystified me. I think, I think that a good game should have a, a good balance between rules and open play. Mm -hmm. And if it's too many rules, it's, it's just a bad game. You're, you're describing bad games, in my opinion. <laughs> but those are the successful, I mean, this is the crazy thing. It's that they're, they're so, like, so, um, I, uh, uh, I worked on the, uh, we made a, v a VR version of Minecraft which is really cool. I created an insurrection in, in my neighborhood in Berkeley when I was doing t user testing with all these like kids banging, <laughs> like, why am I not a tester? Why? And, it's, and they, they really do, that's really open. I, and um, I'm not saying I think it's the worst thing in the world, but I see such a d decreased amount of openness in something like Grand Theft Auto, and yet it makes such a fuckload of money. And it depresses me, honestly. Like, I think Grand Theft Auto has a fair amount of openness. I think Zelda did a better job in sort of like the more yeah. creative things you can do in a world space. Um, but again, I, I think that it's a failure of the game designer if they're not achieving that. Well, that I agree with you on. All right. Um, so the next one, um, what are the most exciting projects in VR, AR, and blockchain right now? That's an entirely different question than the previous question. <laughs> There's no overlap at all. <laughs> but uh, no, well, aside from previously, it was what, what, what things have you learned lessons from? Is there anything that you've experienced lately that just on some level you said, oh man, yes, that's great. Have you had that? There's a really cool project called Multiverse, which is being introduced. It's not out there. You can't play it yet. Uh, but the idea is uh, it's like parallel universes where individual players can design their own game and, and play together, kind of creating rules for how to access other worlds and things like that. Um, and it seems like a, a fair balance between openness and, and rules. But that's just, just to add to the confusion, I'm aware of three separate independent projects called Multiverse that are all similar <laughs> and all kind of in the, some sort of stealth mode or early beta or something. Yeah, I think it's a um, common so goal. So there go there's going to be some kind of Battle of the Multiverses or something. Uh, oh yeah, only one project can be named Multiverse, you know, and, and be played as that Multiverse. But it gets complicated. No, there there are actually multi multi. There's it's multi squared verses right now. Right. It's really strange. No, I, I, I believe yeah. you. I'm, I'm saying that. Yeah. You know, eventually, it will all just become the Multiverse, and they might be three different. Oh, so you think you think you think compatibility is assured. I think most definitely, because <laughs> it's called the multiverse. <laughs> this comes from the creator of the multi-dimensional token. It sounds like you have a... <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right, okay. Um, oh, can I say what was exciting for mine? Oh, yes, please, please. please. I, I, was, I was scared for a second that I hadn't had a moment like that in a little while, uh, but honestly, it came from a really boring place, from using uh, the Block Explorer Etherscan, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a disinterested third party to verify your stuff. They've started supporting uh, ERC721, which is the non-fungible token standard, and sort of like seeing a disinterested third party verify these assets besides you know, just a game interface, just the company who made each of their own, instead of like looking at it through CryptoKitties or any of these sort of toys that only give you uh, a view into this thing that's supposed to be cross-compatible, you know, it's not locked in. Having some disinterested third party actually show up to verify those sorts of things was, was a moment that was exciting for me. Yeah, that is cool. It's like somebody fin finally showing up at the party, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you design this thing for that exactly that kind of entity to show up, and it, yeah, that is that is cool, um, actually. Um, all right, one thing we saw with the decentral with decentraland 
is the purchase of large land parcels by corporate interests. How do we safeguard against situations such as this in our design? This one felt like a quiz uh, after reading the I, well, Radical Markets like, book. It's like a quiz Harbor by text. some like, mysterious, <laughs> you know, mysterious uh, mashup robot or something. I don't know. Does anybody care to answer that? I mean, I feel like the the answer could be a Harburger tax placed on the the land or the decentral land, um, so the self-assessed tax based on their um, or the the self-assessed value being taxed uh, according to like the, Len, the like Len's thing. We just yeah. it. I'm not the expert. <laughs> yeah, I you know. Um, it's kind of interesting. In the old days, meaning the 80s, when we had the same problem, we were really worried about what would happen if, because you might think the original idea is that there's infinite resources in a virtual world, so why have any ownership decay? And the answer is there's not infinite cognitive resources, there's not infinite ability to navigate complexity, and that uh, sometimes having an infinite library means having no library at all. There has to be some way for collectivity to focus, and so, the idea back then was not the self-assessed tax, but it was just a sort of a decay function on where you'd gradually statistically lose control of things and, and people, you know, it's, it was kind of um, a, a more um, uh, a more generalized, less individually variable version of the same idea. Uh, but um, I, I'm still working on the self-assessed tax thing. I, I, it might be the right way. I'm really interested in it. Um, any other answers that did I skip anybody? I don't mean to. I mean, maybe an extension of the self-assessment self could be some sort of network of brokers who are taking on that mental capacity. It's, you have a, a high overhead of having to reassess. Yes. And we propose this, the, exactly that kind of network of brokers would be a MID in, in the paper. We propose exactly that kind of a function for a MID because there has to be somebody to deal with complexity who has a fiducial responsibility to you. But read, that pa read the paper, really, seriously. Um, all right, in the radical markets theory, cost, private property is self-assessed. This comes with both a large, yeah, we know what that is. Do you think these concepts work better or worse with virtual stuff? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not super convinced um, that they, that they mm -hmm. will. Um, I think that people like to own stuff and I, um, I think that the idea that your stuff can be taken away from you just because somebody has a better use for it is uh, like not something that people are going to do well. It's like uh, it's if you exhausting. have a better use for my kid, you shouldn't be able to take them for your purposes. So um, I think yeah. the idea can still be used in a lot of ways, though, whether it's a Harburger tax or like Harburger renting method. I, I'm from Kentucky, and my dad's a horse trainer, so uh, claiming races is a big part of that whole industry. And that's basically self-assessed value of the horses before they go into the race. Anyone can buy it away from you if you have a very valuable horse and you're... Oh, that's interesting. Are you listening to this? Yeah, that's in the book. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. Don't try I don't that. remember that, but anyway, okay. Yeah, if you uh, that's cool. take a really valuable horse, obviously somebody will buy it away from you and you'll maybe win the race, but you'll lose your horse. Uh. Bill, you should tell everyone about the HADS oh, project. Yeah, and for the hackathon this weekend, uh, we had a winning project that was Harburger Ads. So uh, it was online ad space that was uh, basically rent model based on Harburger taxes going to the site owner. Anyone could take over the ad and change the value of it, but they have to continue paying the taxes for it to the site owner. Right. So that's yeah. like a virtual good that's that a little bit. That seems like a potentially interesting startup for somebody to make in general for an ad marketplace. I, that seems like a, is anybody doing that? Oh, come on. <laughs> Somebody in this room should do it. Yeah, I'll sell you the hackathon project if you really uh, want. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, in, in Who Owns the Future, I talked a lot about the art market with thinking of it as being a little bit like Bitcoin in a way, as a sort of a private currency created by a group of people who agree to do that. But in the art currency, and, and so this is a funny thing. So I, I love art, but commercial art, the art collector's world, is actually this kind of corrupt thing where people concentrate capital in this really sort of bizarre and insular way. Um, and uh, the problem, so there's a kind of a cartel that's increasing the subjective value of certain things. And it's an, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, 
potentially problematic. Um, all right. What would a decentralized government with authority over a virtual world or online tribe look like? Is this uniquely different from decentralized governments over a protocol or small real world community as if those two things are similar? Why? Why not? Did, did I read that well enough for it to make sense? Yeah. Anybody have any ideas on it? I guess the rate of change would be a little bit faster. You can move fast and break things when you're dealing with virtual worlds. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about a decentralized organization, you do still have all the same sort of stop gaps of voting and getting consensus, which is tough and slow work. Um, maybe some of the reactions to those things could happen quickly, like whether it's uh, merging a, a pull request to something or setting some new variable in an environment. I'm really struck by uh, how much of the ex exceedingly centralized power of the giant platforms these days, like Google and Facebook, is based on providing the service of some persistence in an architecture that doesn't, in its, that kind of resists persistence. So F Facebook is doing something that I think shouldn't require some big corporation, which is saying, oh yeah, your data, your memories will be in a place you can find them. Your logon will be in a place you can find it. Um, and Google is saying, Google is some kind, Part of its value is um, exploiting and extending the Wikipedia to create some kind of a reliable place where you can find information. Uh, for instance, just now I mentioned the article without having a link and some the, the uh, uh, blueprint for better digital society, and that the persistence is provided by Google. And um, this, uh, it seems to me, th so this, this question of persistence seems very central, because it's very central to what a person is, what makes somebody an individual who isn't just a big mash up with other people. And um, I, feel, I feel that whoever, however, some level of persistence, some kind of reliability in personal experience is created, that is kind of the government, that is kind of the society. Um, and I, I think one of the, the huge, so MIDS can be part of an answer in a highly decentralized society. Whether that's the whole answer or not, I'm not sure. It seems to me just absolutely preposterous that we have a network where we have to have some giant monopoly provide some of that. Um, I think it's just a natural, a lot of people like to think like, well, how did Google amass all this power? Da, da, da. The industry as a whole is so young and we're all, we're all young in it, so it's, it seems old to us, but on the whole, think about you know, publishing coming out versus when public libraries became the standard. Like, mm -hmm. We're still in the early days where publishing is relatively centralized, even though, so I think that um, it just takes time for people to recognize the value of their data, to recognize the value of someone else being their store for them. It's gonna take people having that stuff taken away en masse for people to really feel bad about it. But I think that um, the only reason we're, we have such centralization is because we're so early. Well, we, did, we, we haven't noticed the impact of it until lately, right? I mean, Facebook as a platform was way more open, right? Like, let's, you know, let Zynga drive growth. Let's, like, have all these apps that do this. And then now we have this scandal and Congress puts Zuckerberg in front of them and secretly he's laughing because now it's an excuse to go shut down API access because there's no more growth left. Like, now it's just protecting the kingdom. And so, we, yeah, it's like we're finally seeing, like, okay, we're kind of fucked. I think that self-sovereign identity is the solution or a solution and a step. And the reason that it hasn't been enabled is because of this trilemma of speed, cost, and security. Um, speed being a, a feature of user experience. Uh, the overhead of managing a self-sovereign identity from the get-go of the internet was just too much. We needed to have people come in and do these things for us. They take away the sort of um, benefits of that, but it sort of onloads a group of users till you can sort of readjust those three pain points and sort of take back some of the things that were first there, but there was just too much cognitive overhead <coughs> to expect people from ground zero to have built the internet that we want. Mm. This, interest, this question of uh, <coughs> cost is an interesting one. So I, I was around earlier than most of the people in this room, and there was a time when there wasn't an internet. There were people playing with packet switch networks, and they were, they were not compatible with each other. And the internet was actually created through government bribe. You all know that, right? Uh, it was Al Gore saying, hey, we'll take some taxpayers' money and just bribe all these assholes to finally work together. That's, that's what happened. That's the internet. <laughs> I was there. And... Um, at the time, there was this feeling that the way to make this thing work is to create the illusion of, of uh, costlessness. 
In other words, that it's infinitely large, that computation is infinitely cheap, that uh, there, there will eventually, any second now, be infinite storage. And everybody based everything on creating that illusion of costlessness. But of course, computation does have a cost. It has an entropic cost, and it has a cost to the climate, therefore. And uh, it, it is not infinitely fast, and there's not infinite capacity. There have to be decisions about what information to save, at least in this universe, because of the way it's set up. And so um, there's this interesting question of how long uh, normal, everyday, non-technical people should carry in their heads this illusion of costlessness and infinity, or is that ultimately damaging? And if we're going to break the news to them that it's actually expensive and finite at some limit, when do we tell them and how? It's I, don't, I don't think we'll, uh, we'll ever do that. I think we're forever trying to give the customer exactly what they want. We're going we're gonna to live the dream forever? No, but it'll, we'll uh, find more VCs to finance it on others' behalf. I mean, I think people are hearing about it. That's been in the news a lot lately. Like, uh -huh. data breaches are like, oh, you don't actually have control. Oh, they're making money off of your data. <laughs> like, it's becoming more common knowledge, but sort of the ulterior, the alternative narrative hasn't sort of been strummed up enough. But, but, but not cost, not like, like actual money, like this cost and the, or, or environmental impact. Like, no, but I mean, yeah. the cost for all the infrastructure, it has to be paid for by somebody. It's being paid for by your data. Like, that's how you're paying for it. But Facebook, and their PR team has very effectively framed it as a privacy issue and not a transparency issue. And so self-sovereignty involves a lot more transparency than people are ready and willing to provide, I think. That's the main barrier, the cost yeah. of uh, you know, transparency. And I also think people are shifting away from analyzing costs in terms of the dollars it, it costs, but more about the time and energy it would cost to manage their own identity. Um, it's just not uh, palatable to most people. One thing that I wish was better publicized is how much of the phone bill or the connectivity bill is going to advertising, spying, manipulation nonsense. Um, so um, there, there, there are a few people who've been studying this, and the general result seems to be in pre-published, not yet peer-reviewed data that I, I expect you all to trust implicitly, as I stated for you. Uh, it seems to be that almost everyone could go to a lower tier system and save money if there was a more straightforward and honest system. And I suspect that would remain true even if everything was uh, a distributed ledger because the current system is so massively uh, inefficient. Um, I wish that was more of a general public issue. It seems like a giant issue. It should be part of climate discussions. Um, all right. Um, in virtual worlds, do you believe Mechanism design has a place in shaping behaviors and narratives, i.e., can we apply mechanisms beyond the metaphysical, question mark? What would this look like? And I, 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 f I really feel like I have to re-ask this. Is it even sensible to think of doing any of this stuff without mechanism design? Are we, is anybody who thinks they're avoiding mechanism design just doing bad mechanism design? You know, like I, I, they're, doing it on, they're doing it on accident or by omission. <laughs> what? Yeah. Doing on act on accident or by omission, for okay. sure. That's yeah. So that's, I, I, my apologies to whoever wrote that question. I don't mean to criticize your question, even though I guess I am. But, um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, mechanism design within virtual worlds. Um, uh, I guess can I reframe the question slightly? To what degree should we think like behavior engineers, behavioral engineers, when we do mechanism design in digital systems? Because it's one of those things that you're sort of forced to do, but should you try to minimize the degree to which you're thinking that way, um, or what? Because I, I, I think that's an important ethical quandary. I think, I think people are overthinking mechanism design in that they're thinking a user's going to do this, and then they're going to do this, and they, they design that mechanism, and then they run it in their heads but never talk to a user. I think we can do it on a much smaller scale. What happens if we do this? Put it in front of users, get their opinion, be more atomic about it. But mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people over-designing underexposing users to it. But if we do it in a smaller, more iterative cycle, we'll get there faster. I think the most obvious problem with it is the, the potential for uh, like these automatic luxury communist uh, systems uh, where you're like watching a, a VR experience uh, all day, every day, and making money for doing that or something like that. And that gets a little bit unethical or you know, just inhumane. Uh, so I think that's kind of the main consideration that you might be referring to is you know, thinking about the, the health of, of the world and humanity. 
I think we need to take it more seriously. I think the last talk was really great, sort of outlining a couple engineering techniques, and I think I'd like to see those techniques more accessible to the general developer population. So one thing I've observed, I've been part of a lot of systems designs for virtual worlds and different communities and different user groups, and there's a sort of social phenomenon where the design team, the core team, often starts out very idealistic, and what they say is, what we are all about is respecting the user. We're, we're down here, the user is up here, we're not gonna make this about us. But then, over time, they kind of start ratcheting up, like, oh, well, we could just make things better for the users if we motivated them to be nicer to each other. So, oh, well, then we can get them to do this, we can get them to do this. And all of a sudden, the, the, you're becoming the social engineer and you're becoming um, a central authority. And I, I've seen this phenomenon, um, I wanna say dozens of times over the years. And I guess an interesting question to me is, is there a mechanism to disincent engineers at this, who are working on systems from elevating their own power and influence? Is there some way to put a cost on it? Is there some way to um, shame them? I think competition. Ah, network effect. <laughs> network effect is, is your enemy there. I don't know if you'd call it a mechanism, but having the intentionality of, uh, you know, the intention of, of designing something that's good for people um, is really important. Because if you're designing for, you know, the maximum addiction possible, um, like, the roulette system of just like pulling up Twitter and seeing what's in your notifications or on, on the feed, um, you know, that's, that's designed for the wrong reasons. If you could do something to change Twitter, what would you do? Whew, uh, honestly, I would just have all, in case you missed it, like everything would be I C M Y. Like it, that, that's, that's what I'd do, because I'd just scroll voraciously to find those. Edit. <laughs> oh, okay. and maybe actually remove the likes. I think that something happened when uh, an audience changes or when you have a feeling of someone watching. I mean, it's it maybe has a different purpose for different things, but I'd maybe like to see a Twitter that has no social metrics at all. Yeah, um, one thing I've been thinking, I haven't ever articulated this or presented it as an idea, but there's a sort of a tension uh, between recommendation engines and self-direction. So when, when the internet was young and the web was young, there was this idea of a browse. You're the one choosing. You're choosing what to click on. You do the search. And then it gradually shifted to recommendation, um, initially as a way to deal with just the scale and complexity, but then eventually just in order to manipulate the hell out of people and abuse power. Uh, so I think this, this question of designs that allow people to be drivers, uh, despite the complexity, are possible with good user interface, good tools. And I think um, a tax on recommendation is what I've been thinking about. That any time you put forward information that influences somebody's action, you pay a price on it. And the degree to which you're, like you, you directly, like the to the degree you're making a decision for someone else, you pay for it. That's a, that's a, a thought um, I've been trying to work out. It's not ready for economists yet, so you didn't hear a thing, Glenn. <laughs> <All right>. uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe a better idea even would be just open sourcing it. And you could have that kind of system you know, controlled or you governed know the, the collectively. The problem with open source is that not everybody can read it, so it creates nerd supremacy. Well, you can, you know, reduce that barrier, <laughs> I think, over time. I'm really interested in reducing that barrier. That's like one of my great passions is to try to make code and math just accessible in a public vernacular, but we're just not there yet. This is another one of those things, the order in which things happen. A, a world in which everybody understood code and math would be an amazing world. We're just not in that world. We need better translators. It's so true. Um, we're technically out of time now. We just hit zero. Thank you. <laughs>